Papaholics, the show about hot takes, hotter than hot, tasty pancakes, where Christian didn't think of anything clever, and neither did the writers of the film we're going to be talking about. Uh, again, I'm your host, and I'm joined as always Ouch. by my two... Sh- we're not... Sh- shut up. I haven't introduced you yet. We are here uh, with my two favorite best friends. Chris Conkling. And Brian Dupree. And we have a very special guest from uh, Tinseltown itself. A man making moves on the scene. Uh, you may know him as the sound engineer for such hits as Amazon's Real Acting and the soon-to-be sound producer on Half Dead Fred, an indie film, which we'll talk about a little more. Mr. Giad Chote. Hello there. As a helicopter hovers over my house, <laughs> make sound sound great. <laughs> Only the best audio from the audio engineer. <laughs> Yeah, he for- planned that. He just had that on cue for us. So uh, I know that was actually like just cued in general. I have I have a button right. <laughs> You're gonna hear Arnold go get to the chopper in a second. <laughs> uh, Giad, we're so happy uh, to have you on the show, uh, and uh, talking about uh, just something uh, so great. So what what a treasure we're gonna be discussing. Uh, we are gonna be diving into Space Jam: A New Legacy, but before we do that. Uh, I did want to give you a platform to shout out uh, a project that you're working on. Uh, you're working on a film that's uh, being being filmed or has been shot? It's right now in pre-production. Uh, Half Dead Fred is basically a movie about a medium detective that's hired to solve a murder case in Flint, Michigan. And uh, it's going to be located in Flint, Michigan. I'm going out there to do uh, to do production sound as well. And it's going to be great because the uh, the town itself has a lot of support for what we're doing. Um, our director and writer of the film, Bron uh, Farron, he uh, recently did a lot of uh, murals and a lot of like art things over there to promote the town to make it, you know, more fun and more like lively with more colors and whatnot. And because of that, they were super, super cool and super, super accommodating. And then he's like, yo, we can definitely do a film out here. What do you think about it? I'm like, let's do it. Uh, I'm always about like, let's make a movie. Like, yeah, it, you call me up on Saturday and be like, hey, what are you doing today? Nothing, let's make a movie. I'm done. <laughs> and we did want to shout out too, um, and we'll put the link in the show notes. There's still an Indiegogo up for it. So you can donate to help make this movie, uh, get a better budget and uh, help pay for, What's happening so if you're into independent film and horror and you want to help the people out of flint michigan make a cool film uh check that out uh but uh, we are super happy to have you you were also on our pulp fiction episode from a little while back uh so if you go to i know we're on youtube right now uh we actually have it posted if you follow the link in the show notes subscribe to the podcast it's one of the archived podcasts on the main podcast feed uh, and we'll be hitting our throwback Thursday at some point. Eventually. Eventually yeah. on YouTube. But <laughs> we aren't here today to talk about Pulp Fiction or uh, the Fred movie. I kind of wish we were. <laughs> Half Dead Fred. I just got to say, Jihad, I looked this movie up before we recorded, and it looks so up my alley. I'm super excited for it. I also, after we uh, had you on last time, I watched... I want to say the first half of the first season of real acting in one sitting, and I haven't come back to it, but I need to because I was really enjoying that as well. Oh, thanks, man. I'll tell you, it's a lot. Well, we, we started with basically nothing in the first season, and because it had a good buzz, we were able to upgrade our equipment. So the second season is actually like everybody says it's their favorite one, too. Oh, cool. That's oh, awesome. Great. Yeah, I'll ca- I caught a few episodes. It's well, very. Hopefully, we'll have a movie, right? <laughs> hey, I want telling them that we should have three seasons in a movie. <laughs> here's the hoping. Oh, uh, yeah, I caught the first couple episodes. It's very, very funny. Uh, and you can check that out uh, on Real Acting. You can check out on um, Amazon, right? I might have said uh, that. Actually, on Amazon anymore because okay. Amazon gets stuff. But you can definitely find it now. Now we're just allowing it on YouTube. Okay, cool. On- whatever just look at real acting um or at real acting show you'll be able to find it very cool excellent but speaking of real acting (laughs) let's dive into the main topic today which is space jam a new legacy basketball camp is next weekend you got amazing potential on the court and i can help you get there that's not what i want dad 
You never let me do what I want to do. You never let me just do me. Hold up, wrong floor. I bet Will Smith ain't got to deal with this. Dad! Dom! What in the Matrix hell? Welcome to the space. Welcome, King James. I am the king of this domain. This is the serververse. What'd you do to my son? That is from the trailer of Space Jam, A New Legacy. And the music makes me think it's like an action thriller or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hadn't heard that trailer music, but very interesting choice. Welcome to the space. And <laughs> Can't uh, Can't this compete. movie, this movie uh, was directed by Malcolm D. Lee, written by <laughs> the first problem <laughs> written by Jewel Taylor, <laughs> Tony Rottenmare, Keenan Kugler, Terrence Nance, Jesse Gordon, and Celeste Ballard. That is one, That's two, lot of three, writers. four, five, six writers. Uh, written by Al G. Rhythm himself. Yeah. Uh, with a score, well, we'll get into that. Uh, with a score uh, by Chris Bowers with a budget of $150 million. Uh, we don't have gross numbers quite yet. It is streaming on HBO Max uh, for this month, so catch it while it's there if you have that subscription. And it stars LeBron James, Cedric Joe uh, as Dominic Dom James, uh, Don Cheadle, Zendaya, Jeff Bergman, Eric uh, Bauza, and a bunch of other people. And uh, what are we going to be talking about? Well, we're going to talk about our experience with the original Space Jam and then our overall we're going to spoil this movie. Chris, I know it's in the show notes. I hate to, I hate to do this, but we're going to spoil this movie because it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It do sure. It doesn't. I'm matter. fine with that. I'm done. We'll, 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 we'll play the spoiler warning before we get into that. We'll talk it's about the spoiler verse at Papaholics this week. <laughs> I just, I Let's just spoil it. I can't talk about this movie in any uh, linear way. Uh, so there's just, it just has to all, I mean, the film itself is just constantly bombarding you with content anyway. So like, I, sure. It's, uh, it's really yeah. quite the experience. Yo, I, I still have the same question I had with the first movie and that is, is it really space? <laughs> oh, this, we'll get this into one that. We'll get less into than that. ever for sure. Well, yeah. I mean, one is actual space and one is cyberspace. So yeah, right. but they open Michael Fair Jordan. Point. The hole in the Gulf area. Well, That's no, not... because they no, but the the monsters are from space. Uh, right. Yes, uh, they're yes. on a different planet. So, yeah. with that talk being said, what are our thoughts <laughs> on the original Jihad? You're a special guest. Uh, when was the last time you watched the original? What are your thoughts on the original? Well, last time I was saw it was probably about well, last year. I just felt. Uh... <laughs> I have no. <laughs> Just on a whim. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that I'm, answer. Honestly, last year, there was a lot of movies that were just on a whim that I was just like, well, can't go out, can't do anything. I'm going to try to My feel something. <laughs> Space Jam. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good like, no, but if, I think, you know, I, we, we don't have Jihad's past on it, and I'm sure he'll, he'll dive into that, but like, <laughs> last year i can i can get that if you if you do have nostalgia for that film and you're looking for some type of comfort food like i i can see people going to something like space jam especially you know people around our age yeah so, okay look this way quad city djs is not one of my favorite bands but it's one of my favorite bands to think about <laughs> like you think of the train, you think of Space Jam, you think, oh man, I remember a time where I didn't have to pay bills and like, right, I had to right, sure. <laughs> so like, I mean, it's just, it, it was just part of the, the era. And I, I, I definitely watched it last year uh, because it came up in this, one of the streaming services. And uh, I just remember looking at it like, man, Michael, J Michael Jordan cannot act at all. And I was like, and his <laughs> eyes are always so red. <laughs> like, <laughs> Those are like the two things that like really got me. And then all I kept thinking about was, did I want to bang Lola Bunny when I was a kid? And that's the confusing moment. <laughs> like these we are were, like we were talking about sexy beasts on Monday and uh might be a show for you, Jihad, if <laughs> if you're having these feelings. <laughs> it's like these these fluid thoughts of I never was into sports, but I totally am now. Bestiality, Lola Bunny, I don't know. Hey, <laughs> music is pretty great. But at the same time, like, 
is that Chris Rock singing? Like, things are happening. And before you even know it, the movie is pretty much done. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm wearing a jersey. I have this on. <laughs> I definitely saw it twice in the theater. And I am i don't know what happened here. So uh, I would like to say that it is a nostalgia roofie. <laughs> okay. I think okay. that's a good way to put it. Okay. <laughs> that is a hot take. Nostalgia <laughs> roofie. <laughs> Amazing. Slightly problematic, but you know, I'll take it. I think you speak our language here on the Popaholics. That's the kind of take we look for. Chris, your history with the Space Jam. I saw this movie when it originally came out in theaters, uh, and I was eight years old, and uh, it was my favorite movie for like a year. Like, I remember having a Space Jam poster in my room as an eight year old. I had like a Chicago Bulls lamp because, like, obviously. I mean, I've talked on this podcast before. Like, I'm not hugely into sports, but there was like a good chunk of the 90s where I was really into Michael Jordan specifically. And this movie was just kind of a vehicle to perpetuate that obsession that we all had with this uh, supreme athlete during that decade, you know? Um, So yeah, I I remember like pre-ordering the VHS from a WB store back in the 90s. Those those don't even exist anymore. Oh, wow. But I, I had like all the action figures. Like, I loved space jam as an eight-year-old now uh (laughs) if if i'm going to answer the question when was the last time i watched it well i watched it last week so i could juxtapose it to this new one but prior to that uh i hadn't seen it for probably five years because funny enough jihad and i used to uh you know be involved in a podcast together and we did actually talk about that original space jam film so i was required to watch it five years ago as well However, the gap in between (laughs) was probably a good 15 years of me just like not even thinking about it, not wanting to go back to it because I didn't want to sully what I had with that film as a child. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like how it compares to the new one and which one I personally think is better. But um, yeah, I have a lot of nostalgia for that flick. I don't think it's a particularly good movie. Neither of these movies really are, but um, th- there are definitely some rose tinted glasses there for, for this film for me. Right. Nostalgia. Yeah. Nostalgia <laughs> roofie indeed. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty much in the same boat with you guys. Um, I also rewatched this um, leading up to this. I, I just watched it today um, for the first time in, probably 15 plus years same as you Chris it it had been a long time but fairly certain we had the VHS of this growing up and I probably had seen this movie at least 10 times it was like one Um, of those I remember distinctly it was one of the big puffy ones for me it was like the big plastic plastic. yeah it it wasn't the uh it wasn't the slip cover it was like the clamshell it was the clamshell VHS it was an experience you were already rocking out to Space Jam the song I'm surprised you didn't have one of those little dude the soundtrack I also own the soundtrack like okay I had two cuts (laughs) two cuts yeah well my tape player ate the first one (laughs) two cassettes he said two cassettes oh gotcha gotcha but yeah, um, I have just crazy nostalgia for this movie. So similarly, watching it again, um, it was interesting. I think the music is a big part of what stands out for me. Just him being Air Jordan and having the I Believe I Can Fly kicking off the movie. I was just like, okay, that's something that is like such a, there's so much, there's like layers to that culturally and pop culturally that it just felt so huge. And I really appreciated coming back to it, seeing how it really was in a way that maybe this movie isn't a an actual take on things that have been happening in Michael Jordan's life mm-hmm. and doing a slight spin on them and kind of poking fun uh, at itself, even though it is still this giant corporate thing. What I appreciated most about it this time through is not only how early the Looney Tunes are brought in, but how much time we spend with them outside of Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is not in as much of this movie as yeah. I remembered. And I think that's for the better for, for that movie. Um, yeah, the, the Looney Tunes are are the main focus of, of that first film. Jordan's right. a big deal. And and like like I said, it's like a vehicle to kind of bring him back into the the pop the pop culture zeitgeist. But with this new one, a new legacy, LeBron is the focus, not the Looney Tunes. I do want to say on the acting, and it may just be because he's in less of the movie, 
but I feel like neither Michael Jordan nor LeBron are particularly good actors. So there wasn't a huge difference for me this time around in their acting ability, but I'm interested to hear you guys' takes on, um, on LeBron. Yeah, just very quickly before we get into those thoughts, uh, I rewatched Space Jam as well for this rewatch, and it had nice. been a long, uh, very long time since I watched Space Jam. But I, like Chris, I didn't buy any uh, paraphernalia with Space Jam. <laughs> I didn't go that ham. Wait, I forgot to say, I found a, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did. Uh, something that I never opened a triple play box of three action figures. Uh, from this movie that I have mint in box, Brian. Got. I don't know if I call it mint, but definitely in the box. And uh, yeah. Uh, so so I rewatched it, and uh, and I had great fond feelings. I watched this movie on repeat, as you do when you're a kid. This is one of the ones. That's how I remember the VHS box so vividly. And I rewatched it. I like this movie totally works, uh, and I I actually think that the plot makes sense and it's it's looney tunes and it's like it's it's magical realism at its core but it it like it has logic to all the things that happen Uh, i think it's very entertaining the looney tunes voice acting uh you have some of the more legacy cast doing it uh that had been doing stuff for the for in the 90s and stuff and i i think the voice acting um from i forget who it is it's billy something uh, Billy West does plays Bugs Bunny. Yeah, he he hasn't played Bugs Bunny very many times, but he did play Bugs Bunny in Space Jam. He, that to me, and maybe it's nostalgia. Maybe I'm I'm biased, but even the writing of Bugs Bunny and Bugs as a character, uh, I just fall in love with Bugs Bunny in that movie. He's so great. Mm-hmm. He's such a great character uh, in in the original Space Jam. I, I I think it's I think it's a winner. I think it's fun top to bottom. I think it's fun kids movie. I think a parent can sit through it, and it's it's like made for kids. Uh, and that's okay. Like kids deserve fun movies. You know who agrees with me? Do you gentlemen know who agrees with me that this is a great film? Trump. The, <laughs> Jesus Christ! I, I have no idea. Oh, right, it's Greatest basketball movie ever, Space Jam. No, no, oh, no. I, not as great as me. It but you was know. huge, huge in the nineties. Uh, no, he he would be. Who Danny, agrees with you, Christian? He would be Danny DeVito's character. Uh, oh. So uh, Roger Ebert. Gave it three and a half stars. Now, not wow. everything, Roger Ebert. I agree with a lot in this review. Now, one thing he says in his review is that he thinks Michael Jordan has a bright future ahead in film and television. Uh, which Look how that panned out. Didn't pan out quite as well. <laughs> no, it wasn't, wasn't so prescient. Wasn't so prescient. But did give it three and a half stars, and I agree with a lot of it. Uh, like, uh, Brian, uh, the last thing I'll say, it just has a lot of commentary if you're an NBA fan about, like, Michael Jordan at the time. Because you get that great line. And, and Ebert points this out in his review uh, where uh, Jordan goes, I don't play ball. I'm a baseball player. And Bugs Bunny goes, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. That's just <laughs> really good writing. That's just really good meta contextual writing. So really enjoy the first Space Jam, uh, even on rewatch. And I loved it as a kid. Uh, we now go into Space Jam, uh, a new legacy. And uh, let me throw up the Popaholic spoiler bumper here. <laughs> movie uh is really bad yes. is really bad and i think all of us are gonna agree it's really bad but jihad is on this podcast for a very specific reason and that is because i watched <laughs> a lot of people takes. comment on twitter uh, and it was so much fun and facebook about wow what a garbage movie and, and i've got like deeper thoughts on on this movie <laughs> this chaotic <laughs> sign of our times uh <laughs> that i do think point to like some good work that's happening in it, but it is chaos embodied. And out of all the people that I've ever seen take on this movie, Jihad goes, better than the original. What? Dropping the mic down. <laughs> Jihad, what did you think of Space Jam and New Legacy? All right, let's 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 put ourselves in my shoes at that moment. Where I'm on- <laughs> <laughs> Already walking back. <laughs> we got some disclaimers here, folks. <laughs> I got okay. I just finished watching Space Jam two. I never post anything political or anything, right? And I was just like, "This is gonna get me." Jihad's like, "Let's stir, stir the, the fucking tonight. pot." Yes. <laughs> I was like, "You know what? I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to be part of the algorithm. Let's go with it." <laughs> I think 
Jam 2 was a better movie than Space Jam 1. I am prepared to defend myself. And then, like, the best part about it was, like, a lot of people were just, like, frivolous with their responses. Like, I don't think you're right. You're wrong. I only watched half of it. And then I stopped because it just couldn't stand it anymore. And I'm just like, well, okay, well, you have no opinion then, you know? You haven't like, seen the complete product. There. Yeah, yeah. If you really want to like argue about whether or not it's uh, it's better or worse than the first one, you have to see the whole thing and you have to objectively see it as a movie and not like you know a pivotal point of your childhood. <laughs> so like <laughs> sure. I had to, I, as I'm about to hit post on that, I had to deconstruct my own childhood for a second. And I had to be like, okay, because I love Space Jam. Once again, I also had the paraphernalia as well. I had two cassettes worth of just amazing music. And I was like, but something was just not right about the first one. And uh, as I hit post <laughs> and I waited, I was like, okay, what is it about it that really started to bother me? And I was like, okay, when I'm looking at a movie and I want to say that I either enjoy it or hate it, that I usually break it down into small sections. Like, first of all, the acting. Everybody's going to talk about the acting. Uh, I, I have a lot of friends who are actors now, and uh, I, when I look at it, I'm just like, okay, you put Michael Jordan and you put LeBron James next to each other. And, uh, like, if it was a game of basketball, it would be one of the most epic things you've ever seen in your life, right? It would be. But if you have them do improv, I think it would be the uh, the biggest horseshit ever to be created. I would still, to be clear, I would still <laughs> love to see that. You would watch it, exactly. It Just is the train wreck that it would be. Avatar that you want to see. <laughs> and that's the thing, is that when... Uh, when you look at MJ and Space Jam 1, he is just being himself. And at the same time, there is really nothing to learn other than, hey, I'm in Looney Tunes land. I can make my arm grow four feet longer. That's the lesson he learns in there. That's it. Other than that, he is unchangeable. I think he learns to <laughs> I think basketball. I'm going to... I'm going to push back. Yeah, I'm going to push back a little bit. And 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 I'll I'll say this that I think both movies actually kind of have similar messages. And in the first one the message is Michael Jordan learns to be who he's meant to be. You know, he he's abandoned basketball he for baseball and the Looney Tunes teach him that like he really does love basketball and he should go back to basketball. <laughs> the Looney Tunes teach him that he shouldn't quit his job. Right, pretty much. But also, and then in, in a new legacy, it's the same thing. You know, LeBron, LeBron learns to accept his son for who he is. You know, that's, like that's a better lesson than, hey, MJ, you've always been great. Be great again. You're the only one who's the greatest. Where it's like, hey, LeBron, we know you're great, but it's lonely at the top. Maybe you should stop being an asshole to your kids. Like, <laughs> you see that? But as far as acting goes. Like that only that allows a perfect pass to MJ to not do anything. He's just like, "What's wrong, guys? Oh, why are you people playing that way?" <laughs> Where you're just like, "Okay, dude." Like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, amazing actor. Like I would give him a like an egot <laughs> before <laughs> I would give my, Michael Jordan before I pass a ball statue of acting greatness to MJ. But now, because of that, I also think that the story guides LeBron into having a little bit more reaction. Granny, I, I think he probably would have been better if he actually had his real family. Maybe that would, you know, show a real emotions. Maybe the, the kid would actually be more resentful. Who knows? Who knows what kind of father he really is? Right? <laughs> they tried that. They put him on screen. He's like, fuck you, dad. <laughs> oh, sh okay. It's okay. a little too real. Too real. <laughs> and, yeah, it gets too real, but at the same time, like the fact that he's at, trying to act as a father and not just a, a great basketball player, that only that shows that there's a nugget of advanced. Just a nugget, not not too big, that shows that LeBron is expanding beyond what he's supposed to do. And hey, that's the funny thing about this this movie too, is that it's showing LeBron expanding beyond his normal personality while his Space Jam is saying, hey, MJ, go back to who you were. You are not good at anything else. <laughs> like, stay <laughs> who you are. Do not stand on that character. <laughs> like, that's, that's the one thing I got, and that was from the acting. 
Uh, the other part about it is like I'm really big on aesthetics. I'm I'm currently like developing a cartoon as well. I can't go into details about it, but like I've been doing a lot more research on aesthetics and and how animation is done. And because of that, I like I'm I'm looking at the way that Space Jam two looked like versus Space Jam one. If you look mm -hmm. at Space Jam one, one of the things that they really really uh, uh, advanced at at that point uh, was being able to green screen an entire basketball court and then just kind of piece together and post where Michael Jordan was running around. Like there's a, a whole bunch of articles later on of people who are doing the animation afterwards that they're like, this was hell, everyone hated it. And but Jordan had fun, whatever. <laughs> like, but then you look at Space Jam 2 and you have three options. Of course, you have the live world, and then you have the 2D world, and then you have this like textured 3D world. Now you could argue that oh well, one of them or two of them are not that great, whatever. Like the real world sucks. Hey, <laughs> we all hate life, huh? <laughs> but like <laughs> the thing, the thing that you gotta look at is like it gives you a smorgasbord of, 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 of texture to work with. And like, it reminded me a lot of, uh, of into the spider verse. Like there's just something that as the story progresses, it also takes the aesthetic and puts it on that journey. So that way reality and fantasy and what mixes together best and what doesn't mix together is actually like shown physically. I think and smorgasbord I really like is a really great word. I, it is. It is. And you know what? I feel like I, ol I will always pause before I say that word just because I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I think it I think it's the most perfect description of what's happening on screen. To represent this movie. Yeah, it's a, a Warner Brothers smorgasbord. Yeah. And that also brings back... Smorgasbord. <laughs> oh. Hey. You, you know that they actually they wanted to do a bunch of different sequels on different types of sports, too. It wasn't just... Like after the big success of Space Jam One, they wanted to have like space golf. They wanted to have uh, space skating with Tony Hawk. Yeah, they've tried to make a sequel to this movie for years. It's yeah. been a long time. And then they gave you back in action, and it was like trying to throw a bone to poor, poor Brendan Fraser. <laughs> You're like, oh man, we love you, we love you, dude, but. That was not the movie, <laughs> but like all that kind of stuff was going on. And it made you wonder, like, how did you get like roped into it? Like there was something, there, there has to be something more nefarious. And when you look at like how these, like these companies come together and try to do these things, like you, you start to, you start to piece the, some, some odd theories. Uh, I don't know if I want to get into this just yet, but like, so far, that's the, the the range of what I was thinking about when I was okay. looking at this movie and saying how much more superior it is to its first movie. And I will defend myself. Hey, that's why we brought you here. That's why we brought you here. Wow. Um, Brian, what did you think of Space Jam and New Legacy? So I'm not sure if I, I would say it's better than the first. I don't think either of these movies are particularly great. But I had fun with both of them. So Space Jam A New Legacy, I've watched twice now. I saw it once in theaters and once with my family, who also um, largely all enjoyed it. Um, I think the movie is trying to say something, obviously, about uh, the generation of content being kind of a mishmash grab bag of previous IP, trying to come up with through social media models and things like this, the optimal product that ends up being just a smorgasbord of nonsense, basically. And Chris, I think you said it in either our group chat or a text to me that it ends up kind of being the thing it's trying to make fun of. Yes. And I think that's that's fair to say to, to some degree. Um, I'm not sure LeBron is a good enough actor to hold this movie together for me, especially on rewatch. Um, it didn't take me out of the movie, but um, I will say I, th I thought his son, who was played by uh, Cedric, Cedric Joe, Joe. Um, did a good job. And, you know, he kind of, him and Don Cheadle 
Um, obviously, Don Cheadle's always great, very over the top here, and doing what he can with the dialogue that he's given. I had a good time with Don Cheadle's character, though. I think okay. he kind of keeps things exciting and is a good, uh, when the Looney Tunes aren't on screen, he's kind of a over the top character that keeps things fun. Something that uh, I was kind of surprised by, this movie is about a half hour longer than the original, but mm -hmm. I think the pacing of it is actually pretty good. I watched it twice, and I, di I didn't feel like there was moments Christian's going to disagree with me here, apparently. But, I watched um, it three I times. I've only seen it once oh, wow. all the way through, but I watched it. Th it took me three, you could, you couldn't it took get me three it. days. Wow. We'll talk about it. Okay. You've that's, seen it that's twice, which is a, a feat. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy yeah. the pacing worked, worked, for, worked for you. Yeah, I, I didn't think that it, it particularly dragged, although I, I do think the Looney Tunes could have showed up and been more prominent earlier. Um, I think they, especially in comparison to the first one, we don't get nearly the depiction of character uh, for as many Looney Tunes as we do in this one, which is a bit disappointing, I think. But overall, um, I had fun with it. And this may be a hot take, but... <coughs> Even though it was kind of like mishmash, grab bag, IP things, things like the Mad Max moment and introducing our characters and finding where they, what worlds they decided to go to, in as far as that showed us what the characters were, I thought that was a, a fun. That stuff was fun. fun gimmick. Yeah. yeah, it was the Kingdom Hearts game for WB. Yeah. Uh, it even looks like the planets uh, in Kingdom Hearts. That's totally spot on, Jihad. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, they're even in a fucking. I mean, Marvin the Martian spaceship is essentially the fucking gummy ship. In, yeah, uh, in Kingdom yes. Hearts. Like, the story is the story is way easier to follow than actual Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> well, that's definitely true. LeBron's <laughs> costume changes based on like what world they're in, so he can blend yeah. in. Like it's Kingdom Hearts, man. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if we're going to get into favorite moments. We'll get into favorite moments later, but I'll just say that I think in terms of where this movie is going and how it's going to play out, it's all very much on the page from the beginning. So even though there is, like you said, more of an arc maybe in this one for LeBron's <laughs> character. It is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It you're is. Fine, we fine. know where it's going to go because just that the plot demands it against all conceivable notions we know where it's gonna go even if it's like why are we going there you know what i mean we know where it's gonna that's what's frustrating is that you know where it's going but every stop you're like this movie doesn't want to go there is it feels like it's trying so hard to not end up in a basketball game what if i told you <laughs> right right that <laughs> anyway there, there is a reason i don't want to get into it yet because i want i want to hear your take first but we're gonna go into the deep, the the the, the deep Q moments of these things. <laughs> oh my! I'm here for it, uh, Brian. Uh, very well put, as per usual. Chris, your take on Space Jam: A New Legacy. So, uh, kind of like Brian, I watched this movie once all the way through, and then. Uh, like I said, I ended up going back to the original so I could juxtapose the two. And then I found myself actually forgetting what had happened in A New Legacy. <laughs> so I had to go back and skim through A New Legacy. I didn't even sit down and, and watch it in full the second time. I, I literally just like jumped around to remember what had happened. But um, yeah, uh, this I agree with Brian that this movie is kind of, it's a mess. And it represents what studios, specifically, I think Warner Brothers most, has been doing a lot of as of late, which is taking everything that they own and mashing it into this giant pop culture stew and hoping that it works. You know, they've done it with the Lego movie. They've done it with the Lego Batman movie, Ready Player One, Space Jam. All of these things are essentially the same type of product, but... What's strange to me about Space Jam A New Legacy is that in the first act of the movie, it's actually telling you through our characters, through LeBron meeting with Warner Brothers, we actually go to Warner Brothers Studios. Through LeBron meeting with Warner Brothers and talking to Warner Brothers executives and Algy Rhythm played by Don Cheadle talking about how he is going to make the studio successful, it's telling us pretty much how Space Jam A New Legacy was made. 
Uh, LeBron at one point, it's it's meta to the point where LeBron even says like ball players shouldn't be actors, which is a line that totally blows my mind, especially coming from his mouth in the movie, considering that he is a basketball player who is delivering uh, a mediocre performance in a film. Like <laughs> this movie, this movie's like, like making fun of itself in this way that makes me kind of uncomfortable. Um, and and that's that's probably because I have attachment to the Looney Tunes and I, and I know that my opinion of this movie s- kind of stems or somewhat stems from that love of the Looney Tunes. But it's weird to me that, that Warner Brothers wants to make a movie that has the Looney Tunes in it is kind of redoing what the original Space Jam was because it was so successful in the 90s. And yet over the course of the entire film, it keeps reminding us that Warner Brothers fucking hates the Looney Tunes. Like... <laughs> These, these characters that carried the company on their back for like 40 years. And Warner Brothers now is saying like, oh yeah, they're nothing. These characters that are essentially supposed to be equivalent to like Mickey Mouse and his gang as far as what they represent to Disney. And the first thing out of Don Cheadle's mouth when LeBron James enters the server verse is I'm going to put you with the rejects. And where do they go? To the, the Looney Tune world. And like this, whereas the original Space Jam was a celebration of the Looney Tunes and, you know, a, a promotion for Michael Jordan, this just doesn't feel like that, you know, and, and that it, it, what it is, is a celebration of all the different properties that Warner Brothers currently owns. And I just find that really fucking distracting. Like I've heard a lot of people talk about this movie and go, my favorite part of the movie was looking in the stands to see what cameos there were. And to me, that's like the worst thing you could possibly say about a movie. Like <laughs> your vision is going past the main actors to look in the, the background to see what's happening. Like you're not even paying attention to the main story, but instead you're just searching for Easter eggs the entire time. Like how, how much worse could we get uh, in filmmaking where like you're, you're just like looking at the background. It, it just, I don't I know what this say. movie wants to be or what it's trying to do. It, because it seems to be all over the place. Maybe it just wants to be a, a two hour commercial for HBO Max. And I, I honestly think that's kind of what it does want to be, but it pisses me off that it has to drag the Looney Tunes through the mud to do that. It, it's just unfortunate. And yeah, we I know the, kids- We get, we get the Looney zero Tunes fucks. put in 3D and then they look terrifying. <laughs> Dude, kids don't, don't care like at the, all. I thought that was a cool grid. moment. 3D bugs is creepy. <laughs> 3D <laughs> bugs is a little creepy. Oh, but, but here's the thing, though. Don't you think that maybe uh, that's that, that's the whole point of this movie? Is it's not for the kids. It's still for us. It's still our same generation of kids that watch Space Jam one, and it's looking at this one. It's like. Okay, I think they're making fun of us, and I think they've been making fun of us the entire time, which can piss off a lot of people in the audience that aren't paying attention. Because I don't know about you, but like I've been doing the Easter egg thing for every Disney Plus thing that I can watch. Like especially like I, I know you guys uh, like finished with like Loki and everything, so I'm right. Go- and but we do that too. But I'm I'm not like <laughs> see with with a show like Loki, I'm still absorbing the narrative. You know, it's just cool to see in passing, like, oh, look, there's the Thanos copter as we're like walking from point A to point B. There's like a little instead during Space Jam, A New Legacy, you have all this main action for the narrative taking place in the foreground that you're supposed to be paying attention to. And everybody's focused on the background because they're like, oh, look, there's a dude who looks like he's fucking cosplaying as the penguin from Batman Returns. Like they couldn't, they couldn't even hire the real people or like spend the money. Okay, hold on, hold on. The penguin from Batman Returns, nobody else but our generation can like be like, oh yeah, that, that was a thing that happened with Danny DeVito, guy bite gets his nose bit. Like all of that, I feel like is only our group that can like truly appreciate it. Our parents couldn't appreciate it. Our younger siblings couldn't appreciate it. That was ours. Batman Returns will always be a millennial thing. Okay, yes. and I'm not disagreeing. But it's like you know when you're watching a Disney <laughs> Plus show. Like- an Easter egg is like, oh, I, you know, we call it Easter egg because it's, oh, you got to go looking for it. Look for the bright yellow egg. And this was like if the Easter bunny had diarrhea and we just had to watch the Easter bunny just <laughs> shit 
and shit eggs out for like that last half. Of the, the when they get to the court, Giot, they get to the court at an hour and ten, and the rest of the movie is at this court with fucking King Kong and the Iron <laughs> Giant, and and what seems like you know you see the mask and the ghost. You see ghost from the Matrix. Like what the fuck is happening? <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I think it's part of them making fun of us they 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 over extrapolate it so that way you can be like oh yeah we're gonna see that we're gonna keep seeing that because that's just something that we would more likely pay attention to than an actual sports game that goes to a thousand points and then 50 and then back and forth jihad but, if that's if oh, that's, that's the funny. case if that's the case then i think this movie is even worse than i initially thought it was because if they're if they are making fun of the people that that enjoy the original Space Jam, like literally all this movie is made for, all it's here to do, it's not to like introduce <laughs> children to the Looney Tunes and like hope that they can rekindle them. It's not to like show people how great LeBron James is. It's literally to be like, you stupid fucking monkeys, thank you for your money. Like here's this garbage product with all of our properties in it. Like, I mean, and that, that makes it even me. worse. <laughs> products that they put under there game of thrones <laughs> yeah it's like they it, wanted to introduce so kids, they wanted to introduce kids to game of thrones mad Road, max Clock, Fury Road, Orange. and the Matrix. casablanca they, they mentioned <laughs> casablanca at one point that is not for kids that is the not kids meant, love casablanca <laughs> that's not meant to be something that like uh, like, like for instance, if you look at like the first live action Scooby Doo movie, where they have those side jokes, where oh they're cooking inside, but we think they're smoking weed, ha ha ha. The kids don't know. It's nothing like that. It's straight up millennial jokes that are just like, ha, ah, you guys are. If you still want to see this movie, fuck you. <laughs> like it's like your older like drunk sibling that's like Gen X. It's like oh yeah yeah you like the Looney Tunes, huh? Well there you go, you sad bastard. Why you? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is this is like media. This movie represents media and internet culture at its absolute worst. Yeah. Like in, in so the first Space Jam movie, we get one we get one pop culture reference and it's a pulp fiction reference. And yes, it's only for the adults, but we get one. I know. Right? And the rest it, is I, all focused on Looney Tunes. I thought that was a men in black reference for the longest time until this <laughs> rewatch. And I, I was like, oh, clearly Pulp Fiction. Okay, cool. It was done very and that's for the adults. But like the rest of it is focused on Looney Tunes and Michael Jordan. It, it's a more compact, tighter focus. This is just like, I'm throwing all of our shit at you. Like how much of it can you absorb? Don't even pay attention to LeBron playing basketball. Like, fuck it. Yeah, pull away all the IP stuff for a second, right? We go back to our very, very flimsy story arc. You look at like uh, the first Space Jam, it's telling us as kids, hey, we can be anything we want to be. Uh, you know, even if it's like a super basketball player or whatever, it makes you have hopes and dreams. But then like 20 something or whatever, 30 something, uh, is it 30 something? No, 20 something years later, you you get this new Space Jam and it's telling these same kids, hey, just so you know, not everybody's going to be great at what they do. Maybe you shouldn't tell your kids that they should do the same things that you do. You know, you, you don't have to be a king. Temper their <laughs> expectations. <laughs> yeah, it's like hey, millennials. We're we're sorry we made you go to college, and now you have all this debt. <laughs> you don't have to be a doctor. You can you can go and play guitar if you want to. <laughs> Just live like, with the consequences. But also, LeBron like, James kid uh, invented an entire three D video game <laughs> by himself by the time he was mm -hmm. like eleven. So you got some mm -hmm. high standards. If you haven't made a video down. game yet, yeah. you're probably washed up. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that great a video game. I mean, it we'll, did we'll crash. Get to that. It did crash. Christian, how <laughs> how did you feel about Space Jam: A New Legacy? Uh, it took it took me a while to get through it because uh, it's not a it's not a good movie. But I do think that this movie, it, I think we'll look back on this movie and go, that movie was an important sign of the times. I'm convinced that all these names, these eight names that that made this, are actually code names for secret AI. Uh, Dude, WB scripts. is messing around with artificial intelligence to build products. I'm almost convinced that this is their first movie. They haven't told us yet, where they had it watch, you know, a hundred hours of Space Jam. They
They had it watch the entire WB cat catalog. They had it watch Looney Tunes. And the reason it took so long is because it kept s spitting out scripts. And they were like, "This none, none of this makes sense. And they finally got this one. They're like, I you bring on a few people. We can spruce this up a bit. And they <laughs> went with it. And they shot it because... This movie feels like... We could just punch up this script a little bit and it'll be fine. <laughs> which is kind of the deeper thing that's interesting because it is kind of smart because I do believe that they used like a lot of artificial scripts that do data mining to figure out how to make this movie. I really think that they use some of it because they joke about it in the film and the main bad guy is Don Cheadle and his name is Algy Rhythm. He's the algorithm and he's the bad guy. And... I think it would be so ironic if we find out down the road. It's like, yeah, we kind of use some, like we mind and see so we how many characters we put in and what people paid attention to and stuff. And that's how we built it. It, it feels like a movie that was written by an algorithm. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Which is super, super interesting that this is the first like super expensive movie. And this movie is not cheap. The money is there. And to the good points, I'll start with some some highlights. I think... The animation is is fine. I like that they switch it up depending on what world they're in. Um, I like uh, I actually like a lot of the three D stuff. I think the Looney Tunes are horrifying, but I do think that like the special computer effects of them dissolving and them transforming that shit looks yeah. great. Like like literal yeah. best in class looking stuff. Um, and Looney Tunes was, or uh, excuse me, Space Jam the original was revolutionary for putting real characters in that, but I don't think it holds a candle to Roger Rabbit. Um, and, and there's really some significantly right. like breakthrough looking stuff, like the particle effects and all that stuff is really top notch. It's really good. I think Don Cheadle's hilarious. Again, his character makes absolutely no sense. He has no business being in this movie. He's just having fun it's with like it. They're like, he's, uh, yeah. they've given me my money already. I'm just going to have fun. <laughs> it is almost like an algorithm chose him and was like, we did not detect Don Cheadle, cast Don Cheadle. And it's like, you know, it's like it, 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 he's in there only because he doesn't look like people like he hasn't played any major Warner Brothers property characters. Uh He's he's really great though. He's hamming it up. He's having a lot of fun. There's a moment where he looks like Steve Jobs, and that just had me laugh. Oh my he's god! Like yeah, a that's fake, a good. That's a good bit. Fake Apple Store. Something so funny. Uh, it's it's really good. And when he gets angry, like he actually goes full like great acting, Don Cheadle on it, and like he honestly is the glue that holds this movie together. Uh, the downside. He reminds me of Hercules, the the cartoon, the Disney cartoon, mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> Who's the who's the guy who did the voice for it? Is uh, it James Woods? Now the now canceled James, James Woods. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. He's kind of crazy, but you know he's his great. Hades he's is great in Hades, yeah. <laughs> um. So uh, the thing that doesn't work for me, like the biggest problem, is that um we get confirmation that this is the same universe as the original Space Jam, and that right. just fucks all of this up because. The Looney Tunes exist in Toon World, which is in the center of the earth, as everybody knows. So it like doesn't care, but yet it references that it's in the same universe, which it didn't have to do. It could be a reboot. It's called a new legacy. But as soon as they confirm that, I'm like, then what the fuck is this digital shit that's happening? And it's not the same characters. So it's literally <laughs> just like we don't it's just like what Chris said. Yeah, we don't care. We don't care. Unless Christian, all the real Looney Tunes are dead. And these are merely digital shadows. Of oh their my god! Selves. I, yeah, I want to put it past that. Look at I how couldn't even get through it without <laughs> laughing. But these are just digital fucking remnants of their consciousness. So like oh. they have the memories of being <laughs> with Michael Jordan on the right track. When you when LeBron meets Bugs Bunny for the first time, Bugs is the only one talking to fucking pumpkins and shit and drawing his friends all over the place. And He's lost it. Yeah. He rhythm convinced them all to leave and do bigger and better things. No, he murdered them all and left Bugs to tell the tale. Oh wow. <laughs> Poor Bugs. Oh, so dark. And, and this movie does feel dark and it feels cynical in a way that I'm I'm not comfortable with. And and I, I at the end of the day, I think my biggest problem is we can talk about all the bullshit theories and how the scripts all over the place, LeBron. I don't think he's a bad actor. I really think they had him for three days <laughs> to make this whole movie or something. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's a good chunk of the movie where he just needs to do voiceover. Uh, it what really feels like the most cynical is that uh, Space Jam was a kid's movie, and I loved it as a kid. And I can imagine if I had kids and there's new Space Jam, I'm like, 
maybe we'll capture some of the joy because it will have more current references. It's basketball stars from their generation. Um, you know, we're going to get better effects so it doesn't look as dated. Like, let me share in Space Jam's legacy with my child. And then you get this horse shit uh, when it's not even made for kids. Like, Judd, you nailed it. It's It's like... It's too stupid for adults to be like, this is fun. Um, and it's 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 referencing a ton of rated R movies. Like a ton blatantly. Like they're in, it's not just the dun, 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 dun. orange. Like it's not yeah. just that one scene because that scene, you know, the reason that scene works, in my opinion, is that it just works. It, the reference is a little bonus of like an adult goes, Oh, that is from that Tarantino flick, right? Yeah, but I would understand that, like a twelve-year-old is not even no. I I like never know. A twenty-year-old probably wouldn't even understand that at this point. There's there's that that millennial gap, that older millennial gap that's just raised on those films, on those particular references. That that's why this movie is poking at us. It's making fun of us. And you know what? Like I I I kind of agree with why it would make fun of us. And we we got roped in on the first one with all the uh all the uh the, the products and and everything just leading to Michael Jordan just like just jerking off <laughs> for for an hour and, and a half. You know, I do want to be clear like the first one isn't devoid of corporate intention. You know, it it, it was based off of a Nike commercial. Yeah. That, that had aired a couple years earlier with Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. That was really popular. People really yeah. like that commercial. Jordan. <laughs> Hair Jordan. Yeah, but it's just, at its core, it's a simple, fun, um, you know, Warner Brothers uh, IP mashup with, you know, Looney Tunes. And, I mean, it's just the Looney Tunes and Michael but and I mean, the NBA. With, with that being said, the plot of that movie is they're trying to enslave the Looney Tunes and then enslave Michael Jordan for a theme park. Right. So it's still oh. pretty dark. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, and look, but it's for it's kid, it's a kids movie, and this my argument is that this movie is not a kids movie. Like it fails so hard at being a kids I, movie, and it, it it involves scenes from a rated R movie. Like no, not referencing it. Literally goes into the scene. So if your kids like, what's that, Dad? It's like that's a movie I will never show you for like six. Are you talking about the scene where Granny's in the Matrix with Speedy Gonzalez? <laughs> What the fuck I'm is happening in this movie? Why the they, fuck is the you know, <laughs> Looney character in the fucking Matrix? Anyway. They meet two Pepe Le Pew, and they... Don't even get me started, guys. Jihad. The guys know how upset I am about that. <laughs> and then, of course, Lola Bunny was desexualized, which I'm still confused about that from an early age, so I'll, I'll, I'll let that one slide, but, like... That was Jihad, like, oh, thank she goodness. Like, don't need to worry like, about it. Yeah, you're like, that's the <laughs> ultimate <laughs> fuck you. You took away like, Babe Bunny's buns. <laughs> I'm not... Okay, even if you were to take Lola Bunny and Spaceship One out of the out of the uh, equation, and you look at like Who Framed Roger Rabbit with uh, Jessica Rabbit, I mean, there is a weird correlation of just like spankable cartoon women <laughs> and like half live action, half animation things just going on. I don't know if it's in Ready Player One. Maybe it's that girl with the wine stain thing. I don't know. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about jihad on this uh, recording. <laughs> <laughs> but no, to go back to what like what you were saying as far as Space Jam one being a kids movie, I don't know. I feel like it was more just for anybody who is naive enough to just buy into all of, all of that shit. Like just think about this. Think about okay. We already know Michael Jordan has been kind of whatever in baseball. He's definitely going to come back to basketball. As the rumors are coming around, and you're a company, you're like, what if I put all of my like balls and dick into this? Like, let's put all of our music, let's put all of our IP, let's get celebrities that people love. Bill Murray, <laughs> like, and then we just market the fuck out of this. And then as soon as he comes back onto the NBA stage, not only does he look good, but we just made a crap ton of money on so many different facets of our business. Like that is what Space Jam is. It's looking into the space of the real world and the, the marketing world and saying, hey, how much can I jam all my shit into there so that way I can get a return on my investment? Yeah, but they actually made Jamming a movie. Jamming into the space. They made a movie that Roger <laughs> Ebert gave three and a half stars. They made a movie that we all loved as kids. And then this happened 
and it's just mean. <laughs> it's a ref- it but feels mean. We all it was the perfect marketing ploy. Space Jam spoke directly to our feels. It spoke directly to our childhood, and that's the other thing too is that. Even though for some of the references that were in there, we didn't even care about it. We didn't care that Lola Bunny was kind of hot. Well, I kind of did. And we didn't care about the <laughs> pulpit reference that was there. It was just like, hey, this is cool. Like, it, all the colors are so vibrant and the music is great. I got to keep listening to the music. It's always on the radio. It's on Cool 105.9. I don't know what's going on. Like, all these things are happening. And then, like, after it's all done, Jordan's back on the Bulls. He's crushing it. And WB is like, hey, you know what? Maybe we don't have to make another Batman for a while. Let's think this thing through. <laughs> like, so your argument these- for it being a better movie is your argument is actually, no, it's a way worse movie, but we fucking deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm saying that the first one isn't even a movie, and the second one is kind of a movie, but we definitely deserve all the snarky and cynicism behind it. <laughs> Maybe. I will say, to your point about Bill Murray, uh, having rewatched it, he has one of the best lines in that movie, and it's more like as self-aware or more self-aware than anything in the second one. But uh, as he shows up to the game, getting into spoilers for the first space jam but uh, they asked him how he, like how he even got there and he's like you know friends with the producer I'm friends with the producer <laughs> and fucking <laughs> ivan reitman was a producer on that movie and it was just i was like okay that's 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 incredible <laughs> that, that's true too that he only was supposed to do the golfing scene but then when he saw how the setup was for the green screen in the basketball area he asked to be in, in the actual game yeah they brought wow. him back and that's why he's like just dismissed as well at the end. Cause he was just like, all right, I had fun. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just he won the game. <laughs> all right. We're going to go into standout moments just to keep this rolling along. Uh, I think one of the standout moments for me, just saying like this, this movie doesn't even try to make sense is that all the, they get to the final game, all the people are teleported in and they're like, you're trapped. And like John T- Cheadle sets the stage and like, all, like most of it, if it's not like random ass IP from the Warner Brothers universe, it's like trapped people that like now stake their lives on this uh, Don Dom ball. It's not even basketball. They don't even play basketball. They play Dom ball. And Dom um, ball. posterized. And the, the villains come out, <laughs> the goon squad, and the crowd goes wild. I'm so confused. I'm like, what? What is happening? Like, why do they like the goon squad? <laughs> right. Right, because they're now uh, trapped in a digital space. It's just like they don't even care. They're, there's like no one that stopped and said like, well, technically that wouldn't make sense. No, fuck it. No, it's because there's always a cheer. You got to cheer. And it's supposed to be all of LeBron's fans as well, right? And then they're just cheering for the team that he's not on. So, yeah, it makes very little sense. Yeah. Also, so this is a standout for you. Okay. <laughs> also, how do the phones how do the phones suck them? In? Never mind. I don't even know why I'm like. The, the movie doesn't try to be because they show that his there's a, son is a genius Christian well, he sh- created a well, scanning here's app my problem. as well as here's my problem is he invents a scanning app that scans like a copy like it scans a, a 3D element no and it's it's Jumanji two, style two, it just two pulls problems. you in fully. two problems <laughs> two problems he makes a, a like a camera sensor and it and it scans people that's what he designed and then he has a 3D model in the game okay two parts it doesn't do that, and he has a camera on it, and somehow that translates to algorithm being able to suck everybody in through their regular ass phones. Because Pete figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> they don't even care. <laughs> they, don't care. A bit. they don't care. It, like it doesn't have to make I sense. We figured out the answer to that. Like it's not hard. To, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. not hard to say like. Uh, like it's already in the phones, and he, I, I don't know. It just it wasn't hard to make it make. It's not even sense, but just consistent. We saw Don Cheadle like clicking furiously on the phone at some point. And it was implied, oh, that's an upgrade. He just did it. <laughs> Translated. Okay. It's implied. Yeah, the whole. Uh, yeah, I was, um, I'm. I'm sweating profusely right now. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Any any fun standout moments for you? Oh boy, I honestly think the only standout moment for me 
because I was so shocked to see this crossover was the Mad Max Fury Road crossover with Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner. I legitimately laughed out loud and was like, that's really hilarious. And that's something that could only be accomplished through all the negative means that I was just talking about. <laughs> but um yeah, I it just it this whole movie dragged the Looney Tunes through the mud and uh it just displeases me. There is I you know what I laughed out loud at Don Cheadle quite a lot. And I also laughed out loud at the concept of the movie and as it kept just propelling forward, I found joy in the in the chaos. Maybe it's because I'm a cynical millennial, you know. <laughs> but um it's for us. I legitimately laughed at the Looney Tunes part. When uh, Wiley e. Coyote builds the machine that multiplies the balls and he gets sucked mm-hmm. in. This is a great callback. Classic the Looney, any, anything Looney involving Tunes. Looney Tunes antics was fun. That was fun. I just, the multiplied coyotes, because he's just the most sad looking character. Nothing ever yeah. works for Wiley e. Coyote. the Coyote needs to see a therapist immediately and to see just multiplied <laughs> versions of him. Him, like, basically, he made most of the points for the whole game for them. Yeah, like he made up <laughs> like nine hundred points for the in, for the Toon Squad or Looney Tunes team. I don't even know what they're actually officially called. It Wait, doesn't matter. Uh, like you know, it, don't give it to Bugs Bunny. <laughs> give it to the one that nobody gives a shit about, <laughs> Wally Coyote. <laughs> exactly. I I did worked, also though. think that this this moment was absolutely ridiculous, and it was the Michael B. Jordan gag. Wait, that was incredible. <laughs> I I did also, laugh. That was I did amazing. laugh out loud. That, that is one of my standouts. Well. Also, not for kids. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, very true. I, I honestly believe that there's been a point in my life where I kept like saying like, hey, why is that guy still called Michael Jordan? Does this beat really matter? <laughs> like that shit was, you know, the only thing is, is that I don't think it needed to be as long. He didn't have to, like, Michael B. Jordan didn't have to say anything. Just yeah. them doing that. Was, yeah, was I agree with that. Right there. But, no, that was... But cool. Sylvester being like, that's not Michael Jordan. That's Michael B. Jordan <laughs> in his ridiculous Sylvester voice was so funny. While, while I am talking about the voices, this is something that we haven't talked about at all yet. Uh, and I really I do did. want to call out... I did. Uh, I, I mentioned that I did not enjoy this Bugs Bunny performance. So mine was a negative. Uh, so... This is where we're going to differ. Jeff Bergman is in his 60s now, and he has actually been Bugs Bunny. It's funny that you don't like this performance because he's been Bugs Bunny for most of our lives. So oh, I'm, I'm, I was happy to see, like they, they've had probably like five or six different Bugs Bunnies with newer Bugs Bunny content since we were born. But Jeff Bergman has played Bugs Bunny the most out of everyone that they've had do the voice. And then of course, Eric Bauza is just a phenomenal voice actor who does an amazing Mel Blanc impression. Like you, I can't even believe he's, he's, he's been a voice actor for a while, but he's like younger in the voice actor industry. And it's just like a excellent Mel Blanc impression. Like to me, at least those Looney Tunes sound like when Mel Blanc was doing the voices. Yeah. All but, the other, all the other tunes I really liked Bugs Bunny didn't prefer, but I also don't think he was written very well. Like Bugs Bunny doesn't to me get a lot of really great part moments. Of it. Yeah, I, I will say that a lot of it has to do with just his writing. As a big fan of one Bugs, of, I consider myself a Bugs Bunny. The one great moment you are very Bugs, Bugs Bunny like. <laughs> Bugs fan. Over here. The one great Bugs moment, uh, the TNT gag, when he says, "Of course I know you are. <laughs> we have TNT. We have TNT. It's, the, it's <laughs> just classic Looney Tunes nonsense." But that was that was a good gag. It's still not for kids, though. <laughs> right. I mean, of- well, I used to watch true. Looney yeah. Tunes cartoons, old Looney Tunes cartoons on TNT all the time as a kid. Does TNT even still exist as a channel? No, I don't think so. Oh. I think TNT AMC or something. Oh, maybe. I don't know. They're not down with OPP. Huh? No. Okay, that was bad. Hold <laughs> 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 back from that one before you even say anything. <laughs> Brian. Brian, do you have any more standout uh, moments? Okay. It is one of the most egregious ads in a movie, but I can't say that I didn't laugh out loud when it happened. When LeBron 
gets to Toontown first, crashes into the planet, and it's a Nike swoosh that he that he crashes into. It's so bad, but I thought that was a pretty funny game. I, I thought it was, you uh, know what I thought was even funnier was that the bad team and the good team both sponsored by Nike. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, I didn't even catch that. Nike, That's he doesn't hilarious. care. As long as they're getting paid. We'll be goons, Just... we'll be tunes. <laughs> So aside from that, um, I it's silly, but Granny just drinking martinis at halftime. That that <laughs> big got me. It's just like so ridiculous. But um, yeah, the Michael B. Jordan one. I think that was the the moment that made the movie worthwhile because I I really didn't see it coming. Um, so yeah, I thought that I was, did. That I was had probably it, top. I had it spoiled because I listened. I oh, I was really? halfway through the movie and I listened to the Jezelnik podcast, which reminded oh, me. Oh, and they mentioned it. Uh, yeah, and right, by the way, right. my biggest shout out: the most enjoyable thing about watching Space Jam: A New Legacy. I know it's bad etiquette to promote another podcast. Uh, would you have no relation? It's a super famous person. Uh, the JRVP podcast. Uh, so good. Uh, th- this is the latest episode. Anthony Jeselnik is the only one who watched Space Jam, and it really affected him, and he brings it up all the time. And it reminded me, and they, he spoiled the gag in there. So I unfortunately had that, that gag spoiled. But totally worth watch- listening to that episode. Jihad, any favorite moments for you? Favorite moments? I mean, aside from the ones that you guys had already mentioned, I think uh, the, the first ball gag that they do, I actually did laugh a lot during it. As uh, he's like oh, as yeah. he's practicing, and then he shouts out "ball," and then at the very end, like what, what was it? Like they they use some kind of compound word just to make his brother get hit in the head again. I was yes. like, that's, that's silly enough humor. That would be kid humor, if anything. Sure. But aside from that, like Granny was cracking me up. I was, yes. I was seriously like, yo, this is this is so weird. This is not this is not what I would be watching. But then I also thought, I'm like, you know. What and and like you know I might reference- fuck that granny. <laughs> <laughs> I keep it to the rabbits, man. But in <laughs> retro- Shaw the line. Yeah. Look at all the old, the old Looney Tunes, the old Merry Melodies. I mean that you know there's there's a lot of disclaimer shit that our uh, our kid brains couldn't handle at the time. That yeah, like, yeah. There's a lot of cringe factors, but like you know we. We still enjoyed them for what they are. I will say that the other thing that I, I, I liked and also kind of weirded me out too was just the whole presentation of Bugs Bunny in the beginning. Like, he he looked just drunk and sad. Yeah. <laughs> and, Drinking and the carrot he, juice. <laughs> like, well, I can't remember what movie. What movie am I thinking of where, like, they end up at this guy's house or it's a TV show or something. And the guy's like, you can leave, but you have to dress up like my wife. He doesn't like bang them or anything, but he just like takes a picture. Like, that's how I felt Bugs Bunny was like, he's like, you know, if you're going to be here, you might as well dress up like my friends and act the way that I tell them they act. And like, it's, it's not even like, it's not even sad. It's just, it's both creepy and like depressing because you're like, at that point, if anybody ever thought that Bugs Bunny was the greatest character of all time, because you can go toe to toe with the rat, you look at like, oh, he's nothing without his supporting characters. And like that for me was like, you know, mm. hey, you know, the, Bugs Bunny is nobody without his, you know, without his Daffy, without his uh, Tal- Elmer Fudd. Stuff. Uh, well, I was Elmer Fudd, and he even proves it by making LeBron do it. And it's funny because for the longest time, like the biggest controversy when talking about LeBron is whether or not he is the GOAT and like whether or not he surpasses Jordan in the history of basketball or Kobe does or whatever. There's always that question. And to see him get put into the the secondary position to Bugs Bunny, it's like they're exchanging their own experiences back and forth. And I, I mean, I don't know how deep this is getting, but it's just like, it really like hit me. I'm like, yo, you know, Bugs, Bugs ain't got it got it going on unless he's got somebody who can really support him. And that's why, and this is actually going to you, Chris. <laughs> I'm coming for you now. Is that <laughs> you, you kept saying the thing where like, you know, it really drags uh the Looney Tunes in the mud. The, the, the Looney Tunes have been dragged uh, into the mud way before this movie. Like back, did you watch back in action? That I was haven't. supposed to see that was supposed to be a sequel. <laughs> like it is fucking awful <laughs> and I, I like that's a so, whole other 
a whole other podcast. That, yes, that that movie's awful. I always go back. There's a really excellent cartoon that came out in like 2010 to 2013-ish. It's called The Looney Tunes Show. And it's a sitcom setup in which Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck are forced to live together. And all the other Looney Tunes characters are their neighbors. And it's literally a sitcom. It's like a Seinfeld sitcom. Then I watched that show from front to back every single episode. It's probably the best Looney Tunes that has been made in the last 10 years. And that came out after Back in Action. So yeah. they're hit and miss, I think. You know, it depends on, on the creative team. I would, I would even propose that that's a WB thing. Like, it takes a lot of planning and it takes, a, like, a Kevin Feige to, to get things right. And the problem with, uh, with, uh, with WB property is you'll have, like, you'll have a Space Jam 1, but then also you'll have, like, Batman and Robin. <laughs> you'll have all these other things. And, the, like, I feel like the people who are writing these, these scripts, the eight unknown al algae rhythms that are doing it <laughs> they're, what they're probably really doing is they're exposing the fact that a lot of these movies are being like ruined by their fans and uh, if not ruined then highly affected by the fans where they can't just exist and then that's it like you look at like the the snyder verse stuff i wish i could talk to you guys about that stuff <laughs> but like you look at how that has affected cinema where the motherfucker got to go back and made, and redo things, got funding to do that never happens. That's no, that doesn't happen. Can you imagine if like Kevin Costner could go back and do Waterworld? <laughs> like no, the Snyder Cut was a rare occurrence that was entirely dependent on like the current state of the world. Yeah, and, and I mean there were there, there was a lot of elements like that led to that happening and with uh with what's his name ray fisher going through all the racist stuff and all that oh there's a lot of shit no no doubt but the simple factor that they accomplished that 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 changed everything and that and that's a wb thing that they, they have that them and hbo they have the the credit for that so I, like i i you look at when they're they're dealing with all their IPs and stuff, and especially Looney Tunes, and they're up, they have their ups and they have their downs. Ultimately, I don't think they're looking at like trying to tell a good story. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to like create an experience that you will lump a good story into there eventually. It's kind of like James Cameron. <laughs> it's like I don't give a shit about Avatar, but if James Cameron's gonna invent a way for me to see 3D in a theater without using glasses, you're damn well sure I'm going to go and watch that movie. <laughs> you know? That was the main draw of that film, new technology. Exactly. And he, that's him raising the bar, right? That, and that's the thing is that I think WB, they are like, okay, what can we do to showcase the fact that we have all this awesome IP? They did Ready Player One. They, they're like, okay, we test the waters out. Let's see how we can do that with our new animation studios or whatever. Because remember, Space Jam 1, they had to create new animation studios to accommodate for, like, all the extra bullshit they had to deal with with MJ. So they'll probably do that kind of stuff. And then before you know it, they're like, okay, well, I guess we need to have a story for this. Let's bring out some a surefire plan. We got Bugs Bunny and we got the king. We're good. <laughs> like, I feel like that's that's their mentality. Whereas... Disney is like, yo, we got everybody's stories. We're going to try really hard to, to, to honor you, but we're going to screw up. That's why there's a multiverse. <laughs> like, it's just, it's such a weird time. I don't know. What do you guys think about that, about WB in general playing with you? <laughs> I don't appreciate it. Hello, YouTube watchers. Hard cut there, I know. And this is indicating that some time has passed since we recorded that episode last week. Uh, but we really wanted to bring it to you. We thought we lost the whole episode. We did not, uh, but we didn't have uh, an ending. We The video actually stopped. So this is us giving you a proper ending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want more from us, subscribe on the YouTube channel, as well as if you follow the link down below, you can uh, get a link to all our social media, as well as the podcast, the audio feed, uh, where there's a little more content there. Subscribe to get the latest from Popaholics. Uh, please, again, subscribe to our YouTube. And also, uh, we want to thank Jihad Choate for being a guest. He was awesome. 
And uh, please uh, visit the Indiegogo for um, Half Dead Fred to support that. Real acting he also worked on. Uh, that is available on YouTube as well. Uh, thanks to Chris, who is at Chris Conkling on Twitter. Brian, who is at True Papaholic. And me, Christian Katie. Find my band at Midnight Satire. Find Midnight Satire streaming on all major streaming services. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you all for being here. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. What do you think of Space Jam? Put it in the comments below. Uh, and if you want to send us an email with any questions, comments, or concerns, popboxcast at gmail.com. This is Christian signing off from my very messy closet room. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week uh, on the YouTube weekly upload. Have a great day. Ha!